So you're going to notice that this is my first video in a while now. Uh, the reason for that is because I was uh, traveling. I actually had a job interview all the way out in Nebraska. Um, so I had to deal with that and then dealing with some of the fallout from that and then just kind of getting back into the swing of things. It, uh, it took a while. In any case, I'm back and my first video is, I hope, going to be kind of a big one. And the thesis of this video is going to be, uh, what do you want out of Comic Skate? Comic Skate, I have been on record multiple times saying that I hate that name. Uh, I don't think it has a whole lot to do with Gamergate. It's, and just the name itself just sounds really derivative and stupid. Um, but uh, a name is a name. It's the name that we've been stuck with. It's the name that people outside of us call us. So even though you could say that, well, you're not really part of this Comic Skate thing, uh, if you basically agree with me or with other YouTubers like Yellow Flash or That Umbrella Guy or Mim Headroom or Diversity in Comics, you're in Comics Gate even if you don't want to be. It's unfortunate, but it's true. So the title then is going to be What Do You Want Out of Comics Gate? Because I think we finally reached the point where um, we're getting to some, we're moving on to another phase of it. I'm not really sure what that phase is, but criticizing bad comic books and criticizing bad artwork and storylines and business decisions that only gets you so far that's one of the big things that uh, separates us from gamergate is that gamergate was entirely based off of criticizing things in my opinion whereas uh comics gate us uh we actually have the ability to move on so we're going to start with this twitter thread that happened as you can see june 15th about you know a little over a week ago and it was a kind of caustic conversation that uh, Captain Cummings had with uh, Jim Zub and Mim Headroom also got involved with it. And uh, even though the conversation, and if you follow the whole thread, which I'm not going to, there's a lot of back and forth. Captain Cummings, there are times when he needs to turn it down, uh, to be perfectly honest. But even though this conversation was, like I said, not terribly friendly, I think it was ultimately productive because uh, Jim Zub here who is the writer of Champions and a few other books that Marvel is doing right now. Uh, he was on the Avengers No Surrender series that I covered. Uh, actually, he was the only reason that I covered it, because I thought he was actually trying to make an attempt to reach out to people. So anyway, uh, Jim Zub posted these links to his own blog, uh, where he explained kind of how you actually make money in the comic book industry, how sales are actually tabulated, and that sort of thing. Because when we tend to judge sales, we tend to only use the Comicron numbers. Comicron uh, being the uh, site that tracks the direct market, which is local comic shops. These units that are sold to the direct market through Diamond Distribution. Um, for about 30 years, that was how comic book sales got uh, tabulated. Uh, however, nowadays, Jim Zub, in this article on his own blog makes the key case that uh, that is no longer the case. And in fact, throughout the entire thread, his point is that basically Comicron, which tracks monthly comic book sales and trade paperbacks to the direct market, and another series or another website called Bookscan, which tracks sales to bookstores, that basically these give a very, very incomplete view of the entire comic market. And that his own experience with his creator-owned series through Image, Wayward, is a good example of this. That uh, if you read these charts, if you read through uh, his own tabulation of it, that basically there are a lot of sales that don't go through Comicron, that don't go through Bookscan, that are not tabulated in any way that the public can access, that nevertheless get sent back to the publisher. So that he and Image Comics still see the money even when there's no way to track the sales and uh it sounds really weird basically the companies that actually sell these things don't consider sales figures to be something that the public has any real need or right to know and this is something that's been going on for you know basically the entire history of publishing so the comic con and book scan numbers that we can see are not at all the uh picture that they give um, this is something that SJWs have been saying basically since Comicsgate started to pick up any kind of steam, which is that you can't judge the market based off of the uh, direct market, uh, that there's more uh, kinds of, of ways to sell books, that there's trades, that there's digital, that there's other things that are not easy to track down, 
And here, Jim Zub seems to basically confirm that that line of reasoning is correct. Uh, he doesn't give actual numbers, as you can see. Uh, the X side of the graph has time, but the, the Y side doesn't actually give numbers. But according to him, he was not hurting while Wayward was coming out. Uh, I've never read Wayward. I don't know how it is. Uh, I don't really see people talking about it. But apparently, according to him, um, he and all the other people involved in making it were making a fair amount of money. Maybe not great money, but they were making a fair amount of money for a creator-owned book that was not getting a whole lot of press, but was still really solid from month to month. And he basically says that the main thing that helped it was trade paperback sales that were tracked through places other than Bookscan and Diamond, but that they still saw the money for it. Uh, one thing that he does sort of interestingly confirm here is that you can see the blue part, and the blue part is digital money that they earned. And you can see that this is always uh, only a fraction of the green part, no matter what chart you're looking at, which is something that I've heard time and again, which is that digital sales are only about 10% of overall sales, and they've been that way for about the last five years, and his own numbers seem to confirm that. However, uh, just tracking his, and keep in mind, all these charts are just for one book, but, uh, and I'll, I'll leave a link to this so you can read the whole thing, but the, the long and short of this is that he confirms one of the things that SGWs have been saying basically from the beginning, which is that the market is changing. And uh, basically a lot of these SJW books, what we call SJW books, are deliberately designed to appeal to this kind of market. Right? They're going after a uh, new generation. They're going after a different kind of readership. And they're making books that are tailored to that generation. So um, months ago, <laughs> once upon a time, believe it or not, uh, I actually had more subscribers than Yellow Flash. It's hard to believe now. But um, when this video was posted back in October, uh, he had probably about 100, 150 less subs than I did. And um, so he did this video where he's honestly asking uh, SJWs, basically, why do companies cater to SJWs? Right? I mean, SJWs typically, they don't show up in big numbers. Even though Jim Zub is able to make a fair amount of money doing this, it's like, still, SJWs consistently have shown that they don't make a big deal in supporting creators that they like. Uh, I mean, look at Aubrey Sitterson, right? If there had been a huge spike in G.I. Joe sales and trades when uh, Aubrey Sitterson did the stupid 9-11 thing, then most likely IDW would have been able to go to Hasbro and say, hey, um, this guy has a big fan base and we, you know, he's still making money. But they didn't really. They just kind of let him flounder. Uh, and you see this time and time again. When creators uh, stand up to Comicsgate, when they stand up to hates or whatever, uh, they are not immediately met with an outpouring of hard and fast uh, money. Part of that is just the mentality of SJWs. I, a lot of them are poor. A lot of them are uh, still in college or recent college graduates and they just don't have money. But another part of it too is that Okay, so let's say that a creator like Aubrey Sitterson or Mags Asagio or, or whatever, let's say they stand up to Comicsgate. Well, like the old feminist said, you don't get a, a cookie for being a good person. Um, you know, standing up to hate or whatever you want to call it or Nazis and Comicsgate, that's like, that should be like, according to their philosophy, that should be the bare minimum. So just because somebody stands up to us, look at Magic Mirror Comics in, I, I think, Oregon, wherever it is, the one that kicked out uh, the real comic book geek, Dylan. Um, they just went out of business. Uh, they were not met with this outpouring of support from local uh, comic shop geeks. Uh, they just <laughs> it did their last ditch effort to save themselves by getting up publicity did not work, um, and they are now out of business. Um, and a lot of that is because of managerial things. But you'd figure that if SJWs are so enthusiastic and they like you know supporting creators that they they enjoy so much that they would have um, shown up to Magic Mirror in droves to try to save them. And it's, it's not what happened. So, uh, anyway, in this video, Yellow Flash is honestly asking that question, why do they continue to um, support? Why do companies continue to cater to this audience? And I basically tell him that uh, they're not just trying to sell things, which would be one thing. They're basically engaging in social engineering. They're basically trying to create the market that they want. And a lot of it, too, is that corporations are not they're not these soulless entities. They're run by people. And they're run by people with ideas of their own and morals and ideologies of their own. So this piece that I linked to in National Review, 
which National View is a you know pretty staunch right wing site. Kevin Williamson, as uh, if you don't know anything about the the blogosphere, Kevin Williamson was a staunch and remains a staunch never Trumper, which is to say a Republican that refuses to support Trump or anything that Trump does. He actually left National Review, and this is another example because you figure Kevin Williamson. He hates Trump, right? And he hates Trump supporters. So you'd figure that the left would embrace him uh, wholeheartedly. You'd figure, oh, this is a guy that we should elevate as an example of, of the supposed good Republicans that, that don't like Trump, that are willing to stand up to Trump. Well, what happens when Kevin Williamson um, leaves National Review to go over to The Atlantic, which is sort of a center-left magazine? Well, they SJWs dig up this old video of him basically saying that we should jail women that have abortions, and he just, they rescind the offer from him, so he's not able to even get employed at a more uh, center-left, more respectable publication than National Review. <laughs> so this is an example of why you should never, ever, like Kevin Williamson wasn't trying to pander to SJWs, but it's another example of how they, they turn on people that you'd figure that they would be allied of. But basically, this whole article, it's kind of long, um, and Kevin Williamson, he's, he can be kind of a jerk, but uh, he basically asks the same question. Why is it that uh, big media companies almost never throw a bone to anybody right of center any at any time, but then when, like, North Carolina says that they're going to enforce um, basically male and female bathrooms, a whole bunch of big companies immediately pull out of it. Uh, they, they say that they're going to punish North Carolina for passing this transgender bathroom bill and it's like why would they care like why and it's another example of social engineering um they basically think that the future is going to be sjw um they have reasons for thinking this um their own numbers are probably telling them this they see no reason to pander to people right of center so you can say so basically jim's up in this thread he basically says that the reason that they're publishing Squirrel Girl still. The reason that they're bringing Iceman back, the reason that they're bringing Unstoppable Wasp back is because their own numbers say that there may be more of an audience for this than they initially thought. So it makes it sound like it's a completely ideologically neutral thing, right? And to a certain extent it is, but to a certain extent it isn't because the people who are running Marvel and the people who are running Disney, they have their own beliefs, they have their own ideas, they have their own morals, and they're catering their products to what they believe these morals are going to work out to be. So, you, right, you can publish a books, man, which is catered towards a very healthy LGBT audience, and the theory is that an audience is going to show up for it, that an audience has been built that wasn't there before. So they release this book, Iceman, at an initial loss, but then they can build up the audience for it. Well, the question is, why are they only doing it to left-of-center causes, right? Why is it that they're not saying trying to tap into a market like say, the anti-SJW, anti-feminist um, sort of thing on YouTube. I mean, look at Sargon of Akkad. He has 800,000 subscribers. And and he's not even the biggest name, or at least not the biggest sub-count in this sort of category. You look at Diversity in Comics and Ethan Man Skyver. Diversity in Comics has like 80,000 subscribers. Comic Congress Pro Secret has like sixty to 70,000. I'm not sure what it is right now. And they were each able to raise a crowdfunding campaign that got over $300,000 in initial sales, and it's all going back to them. It's not going to another corporate entity. So you would figure that Marvel would be looking at this kind of market here, this sort of countercultural movement, which, by the way, skews much younger than you think, because there are lots of studies that show that Generation Z, which is teenagers right now, are much more conservative than the millennial generation. Um, they're not necessarily 1950s-style uh, Bible-thumping conservatives, but they're still right of center. They don't agree with this whole SJW left-wing feminist stuff. So why are they not tapping into that market? And it's because of the social engineering thing. It's because of they basically these corporations don't see... It's not that they don't see any money in that necessarily. It's just that they don't want to be seen amongst their peers as supporting this kind of mentality, I guess. So that leads back to the question, um, what do you want out of Comics Heat? What does all this rambling up to this point mean? So if you want them to sell books that make money, well, they're already doing that. Um, they don't necessarily make as much money as they could, but Iceman, Squirrel Girl, Unstoppable Wasp, all these books that they are either continuing to publish despite low direct market sales 
or bringing back after being canceled, um, why are they still selling it? It's and it's because of what uh, the kind of thing that Jim Zub is talking about here, where these things have a much longer lifespan than you initially believe, right? So those books, it, it doesn't look like they're making money. To us, they are still making money. The SJWs are right about that. So there's basically no reason for Marvel to change what they're doing. And that's the, that's the crappy part. Until there is a major shift in the market, until people just flat out stop buying Marvel altogether, which isn't happening. Um, like, I know I had stopped buying Marvel in 2014. I only started again because of diversity in comics. Uh, and then I stopped again. I, I don't buy Marvel anymore. But it's like they they had shrunk their audience to a point, and it seems like that audience isn't going anywhere. Uh, it's stupid. <laughs> so there's basically no reason for them to to change their their model as it stands right now because it's still making money, which is all Disney cares about. You can say that you want uh, better stories, that it's not about um, necessarily expanding the market, but that you want better stories. So I am not looking forward to this Justice League Dark series that DC is doing. Uh, and the main reason is because, and it's a dumb reason, but it's still the reason that I care about, is because of this dumb costume that Zatanna is wearing. Uh, this is the basically the same costume she wore in early issues of the original Justice League Dark and the whole point of that costume was that she wasn't confident in herself. She was kind of a wreck. All of the Justice League Dark members were a mess. And her wearing basically this outfit that you would wear to go clubbing <laughs> um, was one of the outward signs of that. When she finally became a little bit more self-actualized, a little bit more calmer and more confident, that's when she started wearing a, a more superhero-style costume. So the fact that they're going back to this just kind of annoys me. And then why is Man Bat here? And then we know Scott Snyder has this huge heart on for Detective Chimp. And so the, it, I'm, I'll probably read at least a few issues of it, but I'm not overly happy with it. I don't feel like they're treating their intellectual property well. I don't agree with it. I don't like it. Here's the problem, right? There's lots of stories where Zatanna is portrayed the way that I uh, feel is closer. And you may think, well, that doesn't, matter that doesn't you know that's not an excuse for for bad storytelling that's not an excuse for mistreating these decades old intellectual properties and i would agree with you but once again from a money standpoint this series got canceled after i think 17 issues or something like that it got canceled with the new 52 whereas this series i mean it's got a lot of talent behind it this could potentially go for a long time so from their point of view the people who want the character treated the way that they feel is better how she how they were portrayed before those stories they've already printed those stories they're still making money off those trades they're still making money off of those uh digital sales that sort of thing so why not try something new to try to expand the audience and if you take a character like say Iceman and you change him from being like a, a bro dude from being a mincing effeminate will and grace stereotype well the bro dude Iceman has you know 50 plus years of backstory that the people who like that version can still get I don't think that that's morally right, but from a money point of view, uh, I can I can see why they wouldn't change it, unfortunately. So that's, once again, what do you want? Do you want characters to be portrayed like they've always been portrayed? Because this trade right here is like $30. So I could just easily get that if I don't if I want that. Whereas this is, you know, an ongoing series that who knows how long this will last. And this goes, like I said, I mean, I'm using Zatanna because it's a character that anybody who follows me knows I really care about. But it, it literally... I could use any character that they've changed significantly in the last few years as an example. So, yeah, if you want their intellectual property to be treated better, it's their property, right? They're going to do with it what they want, and if they feel that changing it is the way to go, they're going to change it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it sucks, but... So you can't really look forward to that happening until it's been proven that uh, the classic way is the way that the audience actually wants. Uh, and in order for them to try that, they have to try something new. And if this gains an audience, well, then there's there's going to be no reason for them to change it afterwards. So if, you, if you're not getting the old characters back, and you're not they're not taking the market the way you want, well, then what's what's the last thing that's left? And that is supporting comics that individual creators that you like and that you respect and that you agree with are doing. Um, obviously, Jawbreakers and Cyberfrog are the most obvious. 
Examples of this, geez, 350,000. <laughs> That's a lot of scratch. Um, 320,000 in less time. This is still has six days left for the initial campaign. Uh, you've got Chuck Dixon here doing his Kill All Men uh, comic. This looks really cool. And then you've got smaller creators like uh, The Ferryman by Sean Campbell. This guy's really good on Twitter. Um, Jack Iron, Steel Cowboy. This guy, Cody Fernandez, has been working really hard to promote his thing on Twitter. Um, I just saw this a while ago, Beatdown Girl by Jacob Beal. This this looks interesting, and he's got a weird like series of skills that uh, that can make this kind of cool. Uh, and there's hundred there's hundreds of other projects out there. Um, and unfortunately, this is another SJW can see, which is that there's all these crowdfunded things out there. So why would you be beholden to the duopoly of Marvel and DC? And so yeah, if you want the comics medium to change you have to show your support for things that are actually trying to change it and it's unfortunate but <laughs> that that's how it's got to be so that's that's the real question if you just it, what do you want out of if you're still involved in comic stage if you're still following the stuff if you're still following all of this controversy and all the things with different creators and all the things with different storylines that they're doing if you're still involved in this what do you actually want out of it because i i just do not think that Marvel and DC are going to give you what you want, to be quite frank. They might, um, but as long as they have people like Son Amun out there, as long as things that, like, Iceman and Squirrel Girl are still making some amount of money, they have no reason to change, unfortunately. Uh, so, in that case, you gotta change things yourself by, in my opinion, supporting stuff like this. Um, which a lot of you have, but that also, just because... They have a big presence on YouTube, uh, doesn't mean that uh, they are the only people worth looking at. You've got much smaller projects that look pretty cool too. So I think that that wraps up my little spiel. Uh, tell me what you think about this. Tell me what you think about this whole um, changing market thing. This whole thing about Comicsgate. The whole thing about the direction the comics in general are going. Tell me what you think about crowdfunded campaigns. If there's any that you're aware of that I haven't heard about that are, seem like they're promising. Um, in any case, this is Unranked Chevron signing off.